So our nation began with an act of obedience to the written word of the living God and the first president. All the elected officials went to the chapel right there in New York City, and it became a harbor for the wounded. And our country was born, and in my opinion, right now, it's being born again. Every day, I hear somebody say, that is a Soros-funded something. How about God is about to fund something? Yeah. Come on, God said, the silver is mine, the gold is mine, all the cattle on a thousand hills, it belongs to me, says the Lord. God is about to fund something in this nation, and it's going to come through you and me. Come on, shout yes. When God's involved in something, He makes a way and He brings a redemptive plan that ultimately saves a people and a country. And I say this because, just because they play their game does not mean that they will win the ultimate game. America shall be saved. God says, I will work a work in your day. No one be told you you ain't I ever believe. America is on. We praise the God of this nation. You saved this place. And here it sits between two oceans, like a diamond that's been thrown across a world of coal. And we are so grateful. Hello, Faith Life Church. We have had such an exciting week with Flashpoint it was. here. And all the great speakers. Wow, wow. Revival in Ohio. Amen. Amen. Yes. And we are delighted today to have with us Dr. Lance Wallnow. He's a strategist, futurist, and a compelling communicator, author of God's Chaos Candidate, has spoken some prophetic words and things. Mm -hmm. And uh, we both like to speak into the mountains of, you know, going and taking your territory and sharing that message. And so today we are thrilled to bring Dr. Lance Wallnow into Faith Life Church services today. Yes, he agreed to stay over and it is a great privilege. Faith Life Church, let's give him a round of applause as we welcome Dr. Lance Wallnow. Let's go. Let's go. Well, thank you. Oh, you're very hospitable, thank you. What a great church. All right, let's get some of these groceries here. Thank you. I'll tell you what, let's do something since you have so much energy. I have, um, I, I noticed, everybody seen the movie uh, Gladiator? Uh, guys watch this movie. This is from the year 2000. You remember this great, I saw this movie years ago, and, uh, and I remember when I saw it, the Spirit of God spoke to me in the theater and said, there come a generation where this scene you're looking at will be a reality. And it was a scene where Maximus, uh, played by Russell Crowe, is in the middle of the arena with the um, gladiators that are in his gladiator school from North Africa. And he hears a voice speaking, describing what's about to happen. And these guys, there's 12 of them, they're standing around looking, who am I supposed to, we supposed to fight? There's nobody there. And then he hears what's called the proctor. And the proctor says, ladies and gentlemen, I bring to you a recreation of the second fall of mighty Carthage. And there on the barren plains of Sarna are the armies of Hannibal, brute barbarians and mercenaries bent on merciless destruction. Ladies and gentlemen, I give to you the barbarian horde. And they extend, extends the hand, and there's Maximus. He goes, well, that looks like us. <laughs> and now he shall face off with the victorious armies of General of the Africanus Corps, Scipio Africanus. No, right there... Maximus, who's a former general, realizes, oh boy, so we're going to face off. This is a recreation of the Hannibal's problem with Scipio. Scipio had chariots with blades that would decimate Hannibal's legions. And so Maximus turns to the others. He says, how many of you have ever served in the army? It always strikes me as he goes, he's supposed to be a Spaniard, but he sounds like an Australian. He goes, how many of you served in the army? And they go, oh, we have. He goes, good, you can help me. 
Whatever comes through those gates, we have a better chance of survival if we work together. That's when the goosebumps hit me. Whatever comes through those gates, we have a better chance of survival if we work together. So, boom, the gates fly open, chariots come rolling in this, with, the, with a thunderous sound. And as they come descending upon this, this little group of, of soldiers who don't have chariots, Maximus says, come together, closer, closer, come on, closer. As they back into each other, he says, lock your shields. They lock their shields in a perfect 360 degree Roman tortoise because all of them had been in the military. And so they understood how to keep a formation in unity. And now as the chariot comes rolling up towards them to break up this unity and decimate this little group, Maximus says, hold, hold. And then he shouts, as one. And they all shout back, as one. And they lean into their shields, kaboom, and repulse the chariot. It bounces right off their shields. And the crowd goes, ooh, like that. <laughs> Maximus, like a true shepherd, says, well done. They'll be back. They swing back around. This time they come in with even greater determination. They barrel down at twice the speed. Hold, hold, hold. And then he gives a unique command which I only know because one day they were playing this and they were doing all the subtitles up on the screen, which I didn't want because it was like people screaming, people yelling, and so it was like weird subtitles up. Everybody was laughing at it, but he, I caught this line. He yells out, diamond! The word diamond was a cue to tilt the shield so that it was an Alexander the Great strategy where as they were, there were these chariots coming, he caused his men to lie down under their shield and flip the chariot as it came upon them. <laughs> Diamond! And Putin, they drop down like that. The chariot hits the shield and they flip it. Now the chariots start flipping. The crowd, no longer uh, uh, anticipating the destruction of the barbarian horde, is actually cheering for a remnant overcoming the odds that are against them. And as it is happening, Maximus gives the command, single column, single column. Now they walked in unity, they can separate. They move into two columns. Maximus gets up on one of the horses that he just sets free from the chariot, rides behind them and starts taking them out from behind. They hardly knew what was hitting them. The crowd is up on their feet, Maximus, Maximus. And this is how they won the arena. They flipped the mob. They overturned the agenda that was against him. And I thought, there has to be even a revelation in that word diamond. Then I go look up the word in the Bible, and I find the word shows up where the Apostle Paul says that um, even now the church is put on display to reveal the manifold wisdom of God under the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. We are on the theater display and the principalities are observing the manifold, and the word manifold means the many facets of a diamond. You have a facet in your church in Ohio that God wants to reveal. You have a facet in another part of the country God wants to reveal. And the body of Christ moving in unity as one is called to deal with whatever hell sends through those gates. And if you'll do it with maturity and unity, you will watch exploits be done that will cause the crowd that is gawking at you and wondering what kind of religious cult or weird thing is this, they will suddenly begin to cheer for you because they'll see the exhibition of the glory of God. Now, now to, uh, to activate this anointing, how many of you are willing to be part of God's gladiatorial display? Well, I figured you're that kind of church. All right, so you put your right hand up in the air. On the count of three, we're going to bring it down. Vigorously, this is a prophetic act. It's like smiting arrows in the Old Testament. And you're going to shout, as one, with all of the Russell Crowe testosterone you can summon. <laughs> as one. And, uh, and, 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 and I will say this. You bring your right hand down as one, like that. And you bring it down like you're breaking something. You got how this works? All right, put your right hand up in the air. So on the count of three, we're going to bring it down and say as one. One, two. Three. That's one! All right, hold it right there. Now, now, I just want to say something. Hold it. For those of you that aren't used to these military displays, I'm going to point out a few observations. If you do it halfway, as one, 
you get kind of, well, it's like a decaffeinated effect. So, as one. Uh, the other one is the casual gladiator pose. As one. See, Lex, the... So now that you've tried it one time, I'd like you to try it again. With twice the intensity. And uh, a few of you have a Pavarotti effect. I'm going to point that out. It's the as one. It's not a, as one. It's a, it's a as one. The idea is to get the echo. Are you ready? This is it. Lord, let the anointing of militant unity and the joy of warfare come upon the people that they will have fun in the battle ahead. The count of three. One, two, three. Here's one! Now that's it. That's it. I like that. Did you feel different? Okay, high five each other and have a seat. That's the way it ought to be. Now, if you've got some business people here, I coach, I do some executive coaching, I used to do executive coaching, performance coaching. You need an ultimate life strategy, people that are actually thinking about what God is calling them to do. I call this cracking the convergence code. Convergence is a great word. I did a master's degree course with a great professor named Bobby Clinton who did research on the, work, on the business of destiny, but he didn't do it as a preacher. He did it as an academician. He studied individuals who had accomplished or were in the flow of the divine assignment God gave them. And he coined the term convergence. Convergence is when the gifts, talents, and acquired skills that you've developed over a period of time intersect a calling that God gives you to put to work those skills, talents, and abilities in an assignment that is uniquely tailored for you to do because it was the one God had in mind for you before you were born. So this series is about how to get there. Uh, unlocking your story is important because I find that a lot of people don't realize renewing your mind requires you know what part of your mind has to be renewed. Your personal history has the keys to your convergence. It also has the keys to your uh, constraints. Any strength overextended becomes a weakness. Therefore, even your strengths can sometimes be your biggest problem. If you're naturally uh, persuasive and good at selling, you might be manipulative. If you're naturally a leader, you might be intimidating, domineering, and controlling. So managing yourself is a big part of being able to manage destiny. Unlocking your story is the focus on that. Your ultimate life strategy is how to, uh, how to start from where you are and figure out what you need to do to get clearer on convergence for your own life. And then gold medal performance is the, uh, the, the, the handful of habits that I've observed in people that are peak performers, uh, in the kingdom especially, what they do that's different than other people. Because we found 20% of people actually enter in convergence. 80% don't. And I like to focus on, well, what are the 80% not doing that the 20% are doing? Those are the things we focus on here. But this is like more for the serious student. You guys seem like you could be serious people, so I wanted to bring that with me. And uh, the rest of these resources here. Now, is there any... Um, let me see, what shall I do here? Is there anybody who is, uh, who would, who is in a period of transition right now? And uh, I feel like I'm walking around with groceries here. A, a period of transition, you would like to get this, you really can't afford it. It's like 140, 190 bucks, I don't know what it is. But it's a $2,000 training I did, which I recorded. But if, if you're a person, who would normally buy it, but you're in a struggling place and you're trying to figure out what to do next. And it has to do with your work. Who are you and where are you? Well, we got, I see, well, I see several of you. You have to form a small group, maybe. <laughs> and I'm quite serious about that uh, because I think you can do something. Now, ma'am, do you know who this man is? This guy here, do you know who he is? Okay, well, you should introduce yourself to, to, to her and take this from me. And this man will be having a home Bible study for you or <laughs> to help you. I figure if he's in the front row, he must be safe. <laughs> Breaking controlling spirits. This is silly. I'll have to tell Melody not to give me a, what bag is this? <laughs> this is my staff trying to help me be more efficient with my multi-million dollar coaching program. <laughs> well, 
giving me that professional look <laughs> that Fortune 500 companies like, showing up with a bag. <laughs> Breaking controlling spirits. I'm not going to take this much time tomorrow to do this, but I like this one because I find out the greatest gift for me in the New Testament, apart from salvation, is praying in the unknown tongue. I'll tell you something. I found something out. I found out that when you pray in the unknown tongue, you are, the Bible says you're edifying yourself, but that's really a, um, a partial window. What you're doing is you're building an edifice on the inside of you to house a revelation of your missing piece. If you're praying right, you are building an edifice to house a revelation of what you need to know. And so when that thing shows up, you got a little radar inside of you that it goes right for it. But then I found something else out. I found it was even more than that. I was praying in my basement. You know I was praying. A lot of Christians, a lot of charismatics, we just didn't really even get this revelation of tongues and diversities of tongues because it's the, it's the window into accessing the mind of Christ. You're praying out. Every time you pray in the Spirit, you're praying the perfect prayer. I mean, it's better than having Joyce Myers as your prayer partner because you're praying with the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost is praying through you the perfect prayer. You just don't have faith in what you're doing. So I'll tell you what happened. One day I was praying, and I started praying strong. The Holy Spirit came upon me. It was in a period of particular warfare. You know, every now and then I've had Antifa blowing up my limos. You get all kinds of death threats. You get different stuff. So you have to have a little bit more angelic has one on your assignment. And I was at home praying one day, and the Lord said, take it up a notch. I said, okay. I'm praying my nice little revelation, devotional tongue. The Lord said, I said, pray strong in the Spirit. I said, oh. I started praying. I sounded like a Nazi stormtrooper for like five minutes, <laughs> which is hilarious because I'm part Jewish. So, <laughs> I was feeling like, wow, this is powerful. I didn't even know what I was doing, but I'll tell you, somebody was taking orders. <laughs> and I said, okay, that's, a, that's good. And I, I went back and I said, you know, Lord, I like to have a little Bible verse for what I'm doing here now and then when we're having these moments. <laughs> Can you show me in the Word what it is that's happening? Lord said, well, sure. It's right in front of you. Though I pray in the tongues of men and of angels, if I have not love, I am a sounding brass or tinkling cymbal. I've done that many times. I used to pastor. I used to do weddings. I'd read that 1 Corinthians 13 kind of as a warning flare for couples. Hey, though, though I have not love, remember that one. The Lord said, you're missing something. There are times when you're praying in English. There's times when you're praying out in the, in the, in the uh, language of heaven so that there could be a release of a revelation. But there's times when you're actually praying out in the tongues of angels and the angels know what you're talking about. And there's times when you're in warfare and you need to be able to give clear, strong communication to the angels of his sign to protect you. Though I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, how do you know when you're praying in tongues the angels that are assigned to you aren't getting instructions of what they're supposed to do? You're all staring at me like this is crazy doctrine. I'll tell you something else. I remember one time there was a film I was supposed to be in up in Moravian Falls, and I had forgotten I was supposed to be in it. It was a movie. And I didn't want to go up to Moravian Falls. I, I, it was like 100 business guys, 100 friends of mine, 100 people retreat I had to do. And I was complaining. I had a friend of mine uh, who was an um, intercessor from Great Britain. He used to work on weapons systems for the UK. Brilliant guy. But he has a unique gift. He can see things in the spirit. I don't always have that gift operating. I more or less hear things in the spirit. But he was in my, uh, I, I, I apologized to him. I said, Nick, I forgot. I have to do this meeting up in Carolina. I made a commitment. I really got to stop making these commitments. I filled it up. I didn't realize you were going to be coming this weekend. I have to leave you here. I'll be back on Sunday. I'm so sorry. Oh, it's Thursday night. He said, it's quite all right, Lance. It's quite all right. He's going to, you know, visit with Annabelle. He's got other things he's going to do in uh, Dallas. So I'm up there. When I get there, I realize they're filming this movie. And I have this. So I'm thinking, oh, man, this is more important than I thought. And I was a little bit kind of out of sync with the weekend because I didn't realize they were filming that weekend and I had to have some material ready. But it was an important weekend. I'm glad I went. And he called me up. He said, Lance, I've been praying for you, and I want you to know your meetings are going to go a lot better. And I said, well, why is that? He said, well, he said, I was walking through your house praying, and I came into your study. And for a moment, I saw angels that were in your study standing there. And they were talking to each other. And I looked at them, and I said, what are you doing here? Lance is in Moravian Falls. 
And he said, and they looked at me, and they looked at each other, and poof, they shot right out. <laughs> now, I, I'm a thinking Christian, and so I try to understand what's going on with these things. And I go, um, Lord, what in the world's that? How do I know that's accurate? What's going on? And the Lord spoke to me. He said, do you remember your attitude going up to Moravian Falls? You see, you set your commitments by faith, forget you were in faith when you made them, and then get into strife when you have to fulfill them and bind your own anointing. Those angels were supposed to travel with you, but you left them back there because you kept on complaining about what you had to do, so you authorized an absence of alignment. Stop authorizing things that you don't want to authorize with your complaining and murmuring. Whoo! Wow, that was a real revelation to me. That when I make these commitments, I make them by faith. If I feel like it's God when I make them, I'm going to be happy when I have to do it. I'm not going to go and complain because I don't want to leave my ministering spirits back in Dallas when I'm up in another state. You'll be happy to know my ministering spirits are here right now. All right. All of that teaching is on breaking controlling spirits because this is where we got to go. Now, who needs to break those controlling spirits off their life right now? Who really desperately need, does anybody here need to go to another level in praying in the Spirit? I'm talking about praying in the Holy Ghost. Who wants this so bad? Huh? They were praying over you last night for real? That qualifies you to get this, I guess. <laughs> Somehow in her mind, that all connected. All right. All right, so I'm just going to stop and move on. I got a great book out here. I'm going to be teaching from the book. It's going to be the, the um, uh, God's Chaos Code. I'm going to be talking about the Chaos Code, I think, which is explaining what's happening now and all the chaos in America and what's going on. Also, the rise and fall of nations, seven mountains, very important, muy importante, because the church is, listen, you know, I don't think we really understand that you're part of a world drama. Do you realize that God's doing something on planet Earth? And all we do is focus on the end time outpouring and a billion soul harvest, that's, in all honesty, that's typically preacher's priorities. But if you're in the marketplace, and most of you are not out there doing vigorous soul winning every day, I mean, you don't want to sound like that's not a good goal, but that's not necessarily the top thing God has you doing right now. So I want to talk to you about what is God doing in the nations. So, for instance, right now, education is, is where it's, it's like it's a, under, it's a mountain under siege because the enemy has been exposed for going after children proselytizing them, but putting pornography into the school, trying to get them confused about transgender subjects and such. And uh, what we're learning is that unless you have a, a vigorous, engaged church that is involved with the, uh, with the boards of education, uh, with the town halls, or with the meetings, if you don't have the Christians that are part of these, uh, these schools, then they know that they're allowed to teach the Bible, believe it or not. You think most Christians don't even know their freedoms that you've got. They think that they, they're actually living like they're under Stalin right now, and you're not. What I'm trying to say is the education mountain alone is the greatest mischief we have in the United States because all the militant anarchy and craziness happening in corporate America, all the Antifa activities seen pulling down statues started on the college campuses. And they went rabid into the teachers' uh, uh, universities so now it's in the teachers who are graduating to teach your children. It's a virus that got into the academic system, and we never dealt with it. We thought it was just, well, kids will be kids. Remember the 60s? Well, you know, the hippie movement. It's different. This is Marxist, toxic, uh, violent Marxism. This is the stuff that will destroy America. And when it gets into the school system, its goal is to try to get the children for the next generation so that they can have from 25 years old down and then they can basically completely alter the substance of America. So the Lord told me tonight, he wants uh, this church to start to look at the mountains. Then, of course, I heard your great song you wrote about the shaking the mountains and such. And the Lord wants you to take ownership of the territory around you. Because you've got all this pent-up power and zeal to go do something. And it has to be bigger than what happens in here. Because most of you aren't called to be in full-time ministry in here. You're called to be in full-time ministry out there, and this is the fueling station. Does that make sense? Bert, I'm going to hand this off to you because I don't want to walk around with a bag for the next hour. Thank you. (laughs) 
So what am I talking about? I'm talking about the model of, of what is happening with the church. And I think that God is doing something, even like with this whole indictment with Donald Trump, what is happening in the last, in the last week, and what's happening while we're here, ironically, is that uh, God wants to heal the land. It's curious that we have the tent event here out there on that lawn. And I was telling, uh, I was telling Bert that last night Tony Suarez was talking to me. He said that Ted Shuttlesworth and Mario Murillo taught him something as an evangelist. And that is, when they take the great tent, which has had miracles and healings and deliverances and salvations under that roof by the thousands, because we've done meetings all over the country with that tent, that it is kind of like a giant prayer cloth. And when it's laid down on the acres before it's raised up, they see it as a prayer cloth on the land to heal the land. And I want you to know that even when the tent is struck, what has happened is the prayer cloth has been laid down on the land. Hands have been on it. We have walked that land over there. We have prayed over it. It's anointed. God is giving you expanded territory and dominion in this part of the country. It's expanding. And education is just one of those areas where, and, and it's because we probably, because you have young people here that are students, you don't realize if you have access to a mountain, you have the authority to challenge the stronghold that is dominating it. You have legal access to the mountain. If you're a student, then you have as much authority to pray with, uh, for a transformation in the school as anyone on the, who's an administrator, teacher, or, or, uh, or a principal. Why? Because you're in the strong man's house, and you have authority to be in the strong man's house, and you have authority to pray differently. We don't see ourselves really as the invading force we are. But I want you to take a look at this now. Grab your Bible to 1 Samuel chapter 10. 1 Samuel chapter 10. We're going to dive into this. I don't know how much of my message tonight will be what I said before. 1 Samuel chapter 10. I want you to take a look at how God anoints kings to occupy territory. When Saul started, Saul was a great king. Saul went off the rails. Saul was an instruction in convergence, how to start off right but finish wrong because Saul uh, made a mistake. And so when you're moving in convergence, when you're in pursuit of convergence, you have to learn from the lessons in the Bible about what can get you out of destiny even once you get in. Remember what I said, any strength overextended can become a weakness. Well, let's take a look at, uh, at, at the strength of Saul at least. Saul, when he first, uh, this just, is just, just so rich. Let's go to chapter 9. You're going to see Saul has, family has lost donkeys. And the families have lost these mules. And when a, when a farming family in the Middle East loses a donkey, that means they have to physically plow the land. And when you're older, you can't physically plow the land. So you've just lost a tractor. You lost the equivalent of the family's vehicle for prosperity. So when you've got the uh, oxen or the mules have left, you really, you really panic because now the family's going to have a problem taking their produce to market. They're going to have a problem even trying to find uh, how to make money to eat. But uh, Saul goes looking for the prophet Samuel. It tells you something about the prophets in Israel. He's going to see the prophet because he wants the prophet to tell him where the donkeys are. And he has a gift he's going to bring. He's going to bless the prophet. He's going to, he knows enough the protocol is, bless the man of God. Ask him if the Lord could show you where the family's tractors went. Because you're a God-fearing family. Your father's worried. You've been sent as the firstborn son to go get the farming animals back. And the prophet will speak to you. And uh, the Lord says to Samuel in verse 15, in his ear, the day before Saul came, tomorrow about this time, I'm going to send you a man. I'm on chapter 9, verse 16 of 1 Samuel. Tomorrow, about this time, I will send you a man from the land of Benjamin, and you shall anoint him commander over my people Israel. He will save my people from the hand of the Philistines, for I have looked upon my people because their cry has come to me. The first thing I want to point out is, in your destiny, your destiny isn't about fulfilling your potential. It isn't about you having a happier, blessed life. It isn't about you being a model for other people. Those things are secondary. It's about you doing what God gifted you to do for the sake of someone else. Saul is about to be anointed commander over my people, Israel, that he may save them from the hand of the Philistines. What's his assignment? 
kill Philistines. His assignment is to deal with a hostile power that is oppressing and vexing and controlling the people of Israel. He will be a commander. He will be a king. He will have great battles and great fame. He will be like David ends up becoming this guy. Celebrated in Israel with a lineage of his own loins, with Jonathan coming forth to be the next successor. He'll have a dynasty out of which the Messiah will come. This is a big deal. But it's based upon a job description. I'm giving you that money. I'm giving you that brains. I'm giving you that physical expertise. I'm giving you that beauty, young lady. I'm giving you that favor. I'm giving you that talent, that opportunity. Whatever God gave you as a gift, an asset, an ability, He's giving it to you so that it ultimately serves the purpose of your divine conversions, coming into a calling where you're utilizing what God gave you for the sake of someone else. He's anointed you to help. And it's that someone else that's in your assignment you want to keep, make a priority. Jesus himself, why did he die? He was sent to the, for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now, of course, he died for us so that we could all be saved. But I want to just stretch your imagination for a moment. I remember reading in the Garden of Gethsemane, three times Jesus is sweating great drops of blood in an agony. He's stretched out, silhouetted in the garden. He is, in a, he is wrestling with something that is bigger than just the courage to die. He has the courage to die, but he's wrestling with sin and death, something month, all the sin of humanity, all that the evil of every demonic pedophile that has ever cried, you know, crawled the earth. It's all being laid on. He could feel it wrapping around him. It's, it's literally he's becoming sin who knew no sin. It's one thing if you're kind of a, you know, a sinner you're used to sin, but when you're undefiled and holy and sin now is becoming woven into your DNA, it pu you push back. He's in an agony over this, the role he has. Three times he gets up and goes to the disciples. I always thought he went to them and he said to them, rise and pray. Why are you sleeping? The spirit's willing, the flesh is weak. Get up. Couldn't you wait? Couldn't you watch with me one hour? Get, get, wake up. Do you know what's coming tonight? This is going to be the ultimate test for all of us. He goes back three times. I thought he was going to try to get up his friends to pray for him because the burden was so great he needed some intercession. Then I realized something. They were never earlier and they never, they, at no point in his history were they the mighty intercessors that carried him through a battle. You see him all night in prayer for them. You don't see them, oh, I'll get up and take care of it, boss. But I realized something. He got up to go back and look, almost like a mother who's concerned for her children. His concern for them and what was going to happen and how this ordeal was going to leave them completely in the greatest test of their life when he is suddenly taken from them and publicly uh, murdered, he got up to go look at the reason why he would go back and pay that price. Three times he got up to see them to rouse them for their sake, but to behold why he had. You have to have a why that is bigger than your own self-interest. Or at a certain point, you make enough money, you have enough security, you're old enough, you say, forget it. I paid a big enough price. I know people who do that. Your, your people, when you get involved with our kind of business and the devil comes at you and slanders you and media, uh, you know, uh, really annihilates you and your own friends draw back and wonder about you, you know, you stop at some point and say, I don't even know why I'm doing this. You better settle your why before you go into the battle. And the ultimate why that has been in the body of Christ for ages comes up all the way back from Nehemiah when Nehemiah told the Israelites for their, in their warfare, fight for the sake of your wives, for your daughters, for your sons. What we do, we do for the children and for the family and for the next generation. I'm willing to go back into the garden for the sake of my children and for the future of the, uh, the youth in America that don't deserve to be put into the, into the uh, trauma of a nation that has suddenly become Marxist and totalitarian and robs them of their freedom. Does that make sense to you? So what I'm saying is you need a why that makes you cry. You need God to show you what the ultimate reason is that you're willing to pay the ultimate price, even martyrdom itself. You have to settle it in your heart that you're not going to bow down, you're not going to back down, that you don't have a price point where Satan can barter with you. Because that's what makes a real overcomer. When, when Saul is assigned to be the king, 
It is for what reason? To deliver the people from the hand of the Philistines. If you want to see why God sets Saul aside, it's because he moves from delivering the people from the hand of the Philistines to stabilizing his own dynasty and authority from the threat of failure. In other words, the focus went to perpetuating his success rather than delivering Israel from Philistines. And he started making compromised decisions. And when he did that, God took the destiny from him and gave it to someone else who would actually fail in many ways, but never fail in the assignment, always there to fight for the sake of Israel. So here you've got Samuel sees Saul, and the Lord says to him, there he is, the man of whom I spoke. This one shall reign over my people. And then Saul drew near to Samuel in the gate and said, please tell me where is the seer's house? And Samuel answered Saul and said, I am the seer. That's one to say five times. Samuel answered Saul to say, I am the seer. Go up before me to the high place, for you shall eat with me today, and tomorrow I will let you go. And I will tell you all that is in your heart. Now, as for your donkeys... They were lost three days ago, right? Don't be anxious about them. They were already found. Those donkeys have already returned home. And on whom is all the desire of Israel? Is it not on you and all your father's house? Two things you can draw from this. God will use your problems in order to drive you to him for a solution. The donkeys was God's way of getting Saul positioned for a divine appointment. Had he, had he never lost the donkeys, he never would have been with Samuel. So, God used the donkeys to get Saul to meet Samuel. Your problems are a vehicle that God uses you to position you for your own destiny. Secondly, uh, the donkeys were found. They were already home. And yet, uh, the prophet says something mysterious. He says, uh, we're going to eat tomorrow, and I'm going to tell you all that is in your heart. Evidently, there was something in his heart that was bigger than the missing donkeys. See, there's something in Saul that was in him that was there, and it had to do with his destiny. Every one of you has problems. God will use them to get you to the place where you discover who you really are. God will use your problems to get you, in a sense, to a prophetic moment where you discover what you're really called to do. Then you find that the problems actually dissolve because God was using them as a vehicle to help introduce you to your assignment. And many times your assignment is connected to the problems that you had, in which case God is already at work in you before you get there. What I want you to see is there was something in Saul's heart. And what was his heart? He was a king and didn't know it. He had a kingly anointing and didn't know it. His head is going to argue with him. His head is going to tell him, you're a, from the small tribe, you're a, you're a Benjamite, who are you? But in his heart, he has a destiny. By the way, many of you will have the same battle. You're in a, right, you're in the great, a great church to deal with that because you'll be taught how the Word of God is actually going to overrule your own doubts, misgivings, and, uh, and thoughts. Everything that God is going to call you to do, I want to warn you ahead of time. I, I do this for a living. God chooses people in one sense who are perfectly adapted to the assignment. And in another sense, they're absurdly not adapted to that assignment. <laughs> Which means that uh, if you're, you, you, a voice could come to you and say, wow, this is pretty good there, preacher. I wish I'd heard that when I was younger, you know. I, I'm a little older for that now. Oh, but you see, your age may be the very reason God uses you because nobody thinks God's going to use someone who's too old to be used. So what I want you to realize is for God to get glory, there has to be some element of insufficiency in you so that he gets the credit for it when it happens. And only God could do this. He, he trains you your whole life so that you have a gift, ability, and a, and a capacity to do the thing you're assigned to do. It's not like you really don't know how to do it. There's something in you that you've been trained to do. But there's an element about you that's totally not qualified to do that. One time, I, I started getting involved with these situations. People, I always love to hear how people introduce me. Nobody really knows how to introduce me because I'm all over the place. I'm doing seven mountains. I was pastoring. I was a prophet. I'm doing evangelism. I'm doing consulting. It's hard for me to even, I do seven, I got all these mountains. I'm not even sure which mountain I'm in. I know this. I finally got a revelation. I got a revelation when I did 
I did a discovery. I found out that I'm an Ashkenazi Jew on my father's side, and my father's all Levites. We're teaching Pentecost. I'm a, you've got, what you've got is an authentic Levitical tongue-talking Levite talking to you right now. <laughs> Very rare. Well, our whole tribe's a teaching tribe. We're the teachers in Israel. That's why, that's, why I love, that's why I love Revelation knowledge. So what I want to tell you is this. If you're too young, perfect reason why God will use you. Well, if I was older, no, you see, that's the point. Well, if I had a college education, no, you see, God gets glory to the fact that you don't have that college education. Or that is really hilarious if you've got your Oxford education, like Heidi Baker with theology. He'll just send you to the jungles in Africa <laughs> where white, blonde uh, Oxford graduates really fit in. So I'm just telling you, nobody's safe from the call of God in the room. I don't care how old you are, how dumb you are, what you've got too much education, too little. God will give you a call that will look to you like an absurd thing, which is why I'm warning you right now. It's not absurd. You're perfectly suited for it. And the fact that you don't think you are is how God will get glory. So I get into these situations. I was saying earlier, I get into these weird situations. And I don't know what I'm doing. And it's very embarrassing because most people would not go to the things, do the things that I do because they would, want, they, would, they would want to feel comfortable before they got there. Well, I don't do that. Well, I can never know what I don't do based on what I'm teaching right now. How can I say I don't do that? Because I know if I don't do it, it just makes me more desperate for God to help me so I don't look like a fool when I get there. So one day I said to the Lord, I said, I'm not really even qualified on the subject. How do I, I, I don't even think I should go. The Lord said, it's not important that you're qualified on the subject. Get this. It's important that you act like you're qualified for the subject. <laughs> because only you and I know you're not qualified. They don't. They have faith to believe you are, and I'm sending you. Now, when I'm in those situations, I pray a lot in the Spirit. That's why I believe in praying in tongues. Because I've got to get words of knowledge when I'm there. Otherwise, I don't know what I'm talking about. And I've had the most profound conversation with global economists. I was sitting in the back of my lawn, got called by a Milton Friedman economist once, saying, what's the Lord saying, Lance? And I'm looking. I said, well, I'm looking at my lawn right now. <laughs> he paused. He said, amazing. <laughs> I said, yeah. He said, uh, grassroots, that's the movement. I said, yeah, that's pretty much what I'm thinking. <laughs> Grass roots. He asked me like two or three questions. I swear, each of them was equally hilarious. I'm just saying what I'm thinking. And he's going, wow, profound. It's like God was talking through me. I didn't even know what in the world was going on. The economist. Put your hands up in the air. I feel like this is my tribe. I can release this anointing on all of you. I've never done that before. Lord, I pray that the Spirit of the Lord will come upon everyone here and that they will be peculiarly equipped for, uh, like Levites, to be able to unravel mysteries and speak the utterances in inspired words of God. I pray that you're going to give them words uh, that are going to come out of their spirit for the situation. And, that, and they'll remember this moment when they receive this, I pray that you will give them the tongue of the learned, the ability, Lord, to be an oracle, the gift of the oracle I release in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. All right. So I've got, to, I've got to land this plane at some point. We've got a whiteboard. I have to put something on it. <laughs> Saul had something in his heart, and it wasn't donkeys. And so the next day he finds out that he's actually called to be a king. He's called to be a king, but where I want you to realize is that once he gets the revelation of kingly calling and assignment, he's moving towards his convergence. He's actually beginning to enter into the assignment that he was born for. And, uh, and, and verse 27 says, as they were going down to the outskirts of the city, Samuel said to Saul, tell the servants to go on ahead of us. And he went on, but you stand here for a while that I may announce to you the word of God. Then Samuel took a flask of oil, poured it on his head kissed him and said, is it not because the Lord has anointed you commander over his inheritance? Whose inheritance is it? His. Whose money is it? His. Whose database is it? His. So whatever he gives you by the anointing, he's giving it to you to steward. It's his asset. 
Israel didn't belong to Saul, it belonged to God. And Saul's going to make a mistake and think it belongs to him. To the point where he's even going to try to kill David, who has been anointed to save Israel. But at this point, he's just doing splendid. He hasn't screwed up yet. That's why he's a study. He's a study in convergence. And when you've departed from me today, you're going to find two men by Rachel's tomb in the territory of Benjamin and Zelzah. And they will say to you, the donkeys which you went to look for have been found. Now your father ceased caring about the donkeys. He's worried about you, saying, what shall I do about my son? Then you shall go forward from there and come to the terebinth tree of Tabor. There, three men are going, to go, uh, are going up to God at Bethel. They will meet you. This is some prophet. This prophet is seeing exactly the divine appointments that are about to happen in Saul's life. Do you know that God has these appointments set up ahead of you before you even get there? God has gone into your future and put the people and the resources right there. So what you have to do is be sensitive. This is why you pray. It's why you stay prayed up and sensitive in the spirit so you don't miss the appointments that God has already planted for you. There are three men are going up to God at Bethel. You're going to meet them, one carrying three young goats, another carrying three loaves of bread, another carrying a skin of wine. Plenty we could talk about there because it looks to me like it's a lot of like about communion. And they will greet you and give you two loaves of bread, which you shall receive from their hands. Now, I want you to pay attention to this one verse. This is where I'm going to stop. The Lord told me to give you this verse uh, for, for this group tonight. And after that, after that, you've met these men going up, and they're, and and they're going to give you bread, and they're going to give you wine, and they're going to give you these uh, skins. After that, you shall come to the hill of God where the Philistines' garrison is. Stop right there. After that, you shall come to the hill of God where the Philistine garrison is. This is a strange statement. We're going to go to the hill of God. And what is on the hill of God? A garrison of Philistines. What's his assignment? He's supposed to uh, save my people from the hand of the Philistine. What I'm praying happens to you tonight is that you will have your eyes open to see that Satan has planted a stronghold on the top of something that belongs to God and that you're called to liberate it. So after that, you shall come to the hill of God where the Philistine garrison is. It's God's hill and Satan occupies the high place. And it will happen when you've come there to the city that you will meet a group of prophets. So this is interesting, a prophetic anointing. They're going to come down from the high place with stringed instruments and worship and a wild worship service and a prophetic anointing and uh, harps, and, and, and they will be prophesying. They're going to be making decrees, and like you had worship tonight, about, about mountain shaking and things happening and going forth and occupying and heaven breaking out. You see, you're, you're in a sense, you're prophesying and singing just like the prophets of God circling what God wants to do. Then the Spirit of the Lord will come upon you and you will be, you will prophesy with them and turn into another man. It's a fascinating thing. In other words, this anointing, these words, this book will transform you so that you will be a different person if you respond to the prophetic spirit, to the worship, to the words, and you let them get into you and let your mind get renewed to reflect the reality of who you really are. So this is, this is the Old Testament prophesying the transformation that comes in the New Testament with outward form, which God's going to accelerate by the Holy Spirit because you're going to have the Holy Spirit working on the inside of you. They just had it working, coming and going. You've got a resident anointing. Let us say it again. You're in an atmosphere of prophetic worship, prophetic decrees, prophetic teaching, and if you respond to the atmosphere that's here, then you will be turned into another person. Which person is it? The hidden man of the heart. The person of the heart. Samuel prophesied to the man. He said, I'm going to tell you all that's in your heart. There was a different Saul hidden down in here that God put there than was showing up on the surface. And there's a different you than the person showing up right now. And if you get, if you get involved with the right environment, in the right place, you will interact with it and you'll be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And a new you will mer- emerge out of the rubble of the old you. And then go, I love this, and then let it be that when these signs come to you, do as occasion demands for God is with you. Now this is such a wild, which means literally, don't worry about making a mistake. Because even if 
you, uh, you, you err, just do what the occasion demands. I am with you, meaning we'll improvise. You don't have to worry about getting it all perfectly right. So long as you're moving in the direction I've assigned for you, I'll pick up the tab and work out the details. You just go there. So here we have this picture. We have the hill of God, God's hill. Let's check out this pen. Oh, much better. We have God's hill. And on top of it, we have a garrison of the garrison of the Philistines. Put a pitchfork there. And God is saying to you, what you ought to be asking yourself is, why does the devil have a stronghold on top of God's property? Because somehow Israel had drifted in such a way that Satan was able to occupy the high places. Remember, remember what I'm saying, occupy the high places. So then I come along, and, uh, and I'm thinking about this, and I told you, your destiny is on the inside of you. God will use your problems to get you in proximity to the prophetic revelation as to who you are. When you're there, in a place like this, you'll have the Word of God preached, you'll have the worship of God, you'll have the Spirit of God, and you can be turned into another person, according to Romans, you can be transformed uh, by the renewing of your mind. From glory to glory, you are changed into the same image. So God is doing a work in you. A lot of the church has a problem. It doesn't have a theological context for where to go with the assignment it's got. It's got all that as one energy, but it's in the sanctuary. But in reality, God wants you to take that as one out there. So now let's take a look. And uh, this, is, this is like the revelation which was, and I don't have time to go into all these uh, details, but I remember how I came to this seven mountain revelation. And, and this, it's, it's become so like a shorthand for out there in the marketplace that people think that this was taught by other people. No, it wasn't taught by other people. God has been trying to get this kind of idea over to the body of Christ for a long time. Bill Bright, who was found at Campus Crusade, believed there were seven world kingdoms. God showed him. And he wanted the businessmen that were successful that were funding youth with a mission as he was on his deathbed. He called them around, and he started something called the Pinnacle Forum. He said, you men have got to go to the top of these seven world kingdoms because the harvest can be unlocked. If we can capture the kingdoms, the harvest will be grand. And he spoke to them. He said, he said there, is the, uh, there is the mountain uh, uh, where the church is. There's the mountain of family. And he said there's the mountain of education. And then there's the mountain of government. And then there's the mountain of arts, and the mountain of media, and the mountain of business. Only he didn't call them mountains. He called them pinnacles. He didn't have the mountain, but the pinnacle represents a mountain. Lauren Cunningham, on the other hand, has Youth with a Mission. How many of you ever heard of Youth with a Mission? So it's, a, it's the largest Pentecostal or charismatic youth group. Uh, Campus Crusade is evangelical fundamentalists. But these streams were starting to come together. And as they started to come together, Lauren Cunningham had this revelation. God said to him, there are seven powerful mind molders of culture that the world uses and the devil uses to shape the minds of nations. If my people will learn to go in and occupy those mind molders of culture, then whole nations can be discipled by the Word of God and by the people of God. Because Satan can't withstand the church, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not be able to prevail again. If my church shows up, you can have authority over the garrison of the Philistines. And so he, uh, he called them uh, the mountain of religion, the mountain of family, mountain of academia, the mountain of politics, the mountain of entertainment, the mountain of news, and the mountain of uh, finance. But you'll notice both these men with separate revelations had the same revelation. Well, it took a donor one day who was funding both of them, said, this is ridiculous. You guys don't even talk to each other. And I'm funding both of your ministries. He said, I just found out where you are and where you are, and you're both only about 15 miles away from each other. I want you to go meet and have lunch on me. Talk to each other. Well, they were kind of nervous because, you know, they're two different tribes. Well, they go down, and sure enough, Lauren Cunningham says, well, Bill, I know about your work. And Bill goes, well, I know about you, you know, Lauren. Um, nice to meet you. 
you know, I've been praying about something. And he pulls out of his pocket his seven world kingdoms. He was just working on his theory. And Lauren was out there in a tent in Colorado at this time seeking God and fasting and got the seven mind molders of culture. And the two of them put their napkins down and they had the similar thing. Now, I found this story out. I said, man, I'm surprised that we haven't got this message out to the body of Christ. But you've got two leaders like that that are both seeing the same thing. And for some reason, the church world doesn't get it, especially because, especially because, say the academic mountain, he's taking over government and the FBI. He's taking over Hollywood and Netflix. He totally controls the New York Times and the legacy media. And now he's in the boardroom of Wall Street with their diversity quotas and their bizarre uh, ESG uh, policies. In other words, the garrison of the Philistines is busy building a stronghold, and the church still, sorry to say, keeps on focusing on if we can just build maybe a bigger, maybe a bigger, maybe a bigger, maybe a bigger, maybe we can just kind of have revival, and we can suck everybody into the vortex of a move of God. I know the theory because that was my theory when I pastored. I believe that if we could just have breakthrough, supernatural breakthrough, keep building a big church, we'd have like a Hoover vacuum cleaner effect on the entire city. <laughs> One day the Lord challenged me. He said, you are thinking wrong. You're not thinking apostolic. What part of go ye do you not understand? <laughs> I started to look it up. I looked it up in Greek. I looked it up in Aramaic. And you know what I found out? Go ye actually means ye go. <laughs> into all the world. And then I ran into a problem. I started going to, the, I started going to all the churches. I, I speak in these churches. I'm a consultant. I'm working with these ministries. And I realized that a lot, of, a lot of places I go, we have churches all over the place, and the country isn't affected at all, especially when you go to the Caribbeans, the islands, you get off, and you go see every, every tent has a, you know, has a ministry. Well, there's hundreds of ministries in the Bahamas, and the Bahamas could still be the sex trafficking capital of the Caribbean. What's, what are the churches not doing? Well, evidently, the churches don't get involved with the mountain of government and police, and they don't take on that stuff. And if you actually go and ask the average pastor, the average pastor, not this pastor, uh, what is your assignment, they'll tell you to preach the kingdom of God, to build a church, get souls saved. And my, 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 God didn't call me to get involved with politics. I, I'm, I'm focusing on, on, on preaching the gospel. And so they, they, they don't get involved. And so you have all these churches all over the place doing nothing. The devil can go ahead and build a garrison of the Philistines, take over your economy, take over education, and then turn around and take over you. Because you let him have too much power. Next thing you know, you got hate speech laws coming down, like Canada. Pulpits can't talk about homosexuality, so they, just, they edit out that and they go to something else. But once you start going down that road, you're already under tyranny. So... Uh, Anyway, so I, had, I knew that I was thinking, well, we're just going to build a stronger, stronger local church, greater, greater revival, and I'm going to have it. I had Kim Clement come, and I had Mark Sharon, I had Bill Johnson, I had Heidi Baker, because I, I was a consultant, and I could I, I, I'd do barter in exchange. I said, listen, I'm a good Jewish consultant. I'm going to help you build this. I'm going to help you with that. I'm going to help you with your team. In exchange, come to my church and preach. And I did that. And so people would come. My little church was exploding with revival. But you see, I wasn't affecting the culture of New England or my own city. Although I was growing my church, I was building a revival center. I wasn't building a reformational center. Now, important you know the difference. Revival. We need a revival. We need a revival. Well, that's yeah, and yes and no. See, re means to again. Vive means to live. Vibrant is alive. So to revive is to bring to life again. You don't bring a sinner to life again because they weren't alive in the first place. You don't bring the secular culture alive again because they were never vived originally. You only can revive what was originally vived, which means revival is for believers to cause us to come alive. But once you're alive, what do you want to do? Pray for revival for the nation? No, what you really imply is, well, they're all going to come under the influence of the Spirit of God and get saved and get convicted of sin and go to church. But here's the problem with that. You see, it's going to be go into all the world. You actually have to go in in order for the devil to get kicked out. You can't just have revival over here and it falls over there and goes, woo. Everybody gets excited about Asbury. Asbury is a very real move of God. But what was it? It was a church college. It's connected to the church. 
If it doesn't get over into Dartmouth and Yale and Harvard and all the other secular places, the moment that happens, you have an awakening. So you got to learn the, learn the uh, lexicon of language because specificity has power to it. Revival is for the church. Awakening is for the culture. Reformation is for the mountains. What we need is reforming the mountains. And what will do that is a great awakening. And what will do that is a revived church going into the strong man's house. Does this make sense? Yes. I'm giving you guys a PhD here tonight. I hope you appreciate this. It took me a long time to fight for this revelation. And, and the number one thing that will stop it is a religious spirit. Spirit of religion is trying to block this revelation. Well, Brother Lance, sounds to me like dominion. Dominion. People always accuse me of being a dominion. I'm not even sure they know what they're talking about. I go, well, let me see. Are you supposed to live under a sin in your life, or can you be free from sin? Oh, you can be free from sin. Well, how about my marriage? Can I have a little adultery? Or no, 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 you've got to keep your marriage free. Okay, how about my children? Do they have to go to the devil or be depressed or suicidal? No, no, your God will save your family. Oh, all right, so I could get saved, then my marriage could get saved, my children could get saved. How about my business? Do I have to compromise and have part of my business, a little bit of my little Bert, little bit of Bert's business? He's going to be doing some drugs, you know, some, you know, stealing cars. No, 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 the whole business is going to be run by, oh, you mean the whole thing has to be done like, oh, so God can bless your business and God can bless your family and your house. How about your school over here? Do you think it's possible you can get the teachers saved, the principals saved, maybe have a Christian curriculum, maybe have more of a godly influence and an ungodly influence so that you've got the kingdom of God? Yeah, I, I believe that could happen. You could have a Christian school, couldn't you? Sure, in which case you would have a kingdom school. Oh, very good. So far we've got the business mountain, we're getting the arts mountain, we're getting education under control. We even have a church and we have our family. I'm, I'm closing in on those mountains very quickly. The point is, Dominion is nothing more than the lordship of Jesus Christ over every square inch that belongs to him, and the whole world belongs to him. For some reason, this offends people who have a religious spirit, I discovered. I realize they're offended at the idea that Jesus could have that much power and control and authority in the earth. That their theology doesn't believe it. They think the Antichrist is supposed to have that authority. Well, I say, well, the Antichrist is certainly going to be there. I'm not denying him. He'll have an opportunity to do his thing. But uh, this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world as a witness. A witness means something's demonstrated. So you have to demonstrate something in each of those domains. Because that's the domain you're actually parked in. If you're a businessman or if you're an aspiring artist or you're a social media person or you're a student in school or work in academia. Does this make sense to you? What I'm trying to say to you is that I, uh, I remember Michael Kratz was the state senator where I had first encountered the Seven Mountain Revelation from. It was kind of interesting. Michael Kratz was, um, oh, by the way, what time... No, 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 I got it. No, no. You know not what you ask. <laughs> Let me just say this. I have a senator who dies 30, 30, 30 minutes, 25 minutes dead, meets Jesus in heaven, has a conversation, gets revived back to life in the uh, hospital after being, after they were actually calling his wife to, to take organs out of him because he was an organ donor. And she doesn't let it happen because she knows he has a prophetic word that he's supposed to be in a political office and he hasn't done politics yet. So you see, what I'm preaching right now is really important. When God calls you into the war, Rather than making you a casualty, it preserves you from premature death. Amen. See, if you don't have any unfinished assignment, then there's a different kind. I can't explain all the complexity of this, but if you don't have an unfinished assignment, God doesn't have the same leverage over what's happening as when you're engaged in a heavenly assignment and Satan tries to take you out. The safest place to be is in the middle of an unfulfilled prophecy. So... He has this call to go into politics, and there he's dead, massive heart attack. The, uh, his wife, Phyllis, is desperate, 
And she goes in and says, the word of the Lord said you're going to be in politics and, and you can't die, Michael. The word of the Lord said you're going to be in politics. And so they call for security because they have a delirious Pentecostal there. And there. <laughs> Michael, the word of the Lord says you're going to be called. Oh, uh, please, security, come down. Security comes. They grab her and they're trying to pull her off her husband's body because she's reaching out and praying for him. And as they're pulling her off, finally in desperation, the wife it's, it's great. One time I was, I was in the Bahamas with him and his wife, and I was doing this story, and he's on the stage with me, and his wife just gets so exhausted. She said, you weren't doing anything. She pushes him out of the way and gets up and tells everybody what was really happening because he, he, he tells the testimony because it's all about him. It's like, she goes, you didn't do anything. I did all the work. And she went up there. She said, here's what happened. I went up there, and that security guard was fighting with me. And I realized, Lord, I'm a young Christian. I don't know what's going on. Michael's not supposed to be dead yet. We have that prophecy. He never fulfilled it. And so she said, I just commanded him. I said, Michael, come back into your body now. And at that moment, he was talking to Jesus in heaven. And Jesus kind of looks at him and says, bye-bye. He goes, you know. His wife interrupted his conversation with Jesus. <laughs> then he goes back into his body. Boom, he comes back. And, uh, and when he was in heaven, he told me when he was in heaven, he, he believes the seven mountains revelation is what happened when he was in heaven. And he wanted me to preach it. He, wants, he said, you've got to get this message out, Lance, because this is what I believe happened in heaven. He said, I saw these islands coming up out of the ocean, out of the water. And I saw God's people in various operations of occupation, education, government, business, art, uh, different professions. It was unusual. It wasn't like it was only churches. He said, and I saw them standing in the middle of these spheres, and they had authority over the territory. Amen. He said, and everything shook, but where they were, it was not shaking. Then I started thinking about what the Bible says. The Bible says, for we are inheriting, we are receiving, and the time is shaking, when everything that can be shaken will be shaken. What will not be shaken is we who are receiving an unshakable kingdom. God wants you to actually have his dominion fleshed out so that it's manifesting in some area of sphere, authority, some place where the garrison of the Philistines isn't in charge, but God has a stronghold on the top of that mountain. So I was, that was when I realized this seven mountains thing. The church really needs to get this down. See, so what God is doing is he's taking these great churches over here, I call them apostolic hubs. These apostolic churches... What they're doing is they're deploying the students and the people to go into the schools, go into the community, go into the business, go into the nonprofits. Go. And what's happening is you're drawing a perimeter because the apostolic church, rather than being separation of church and state over here focused on itself, get you to heaven when you die, come to church on Sunday, we'll show you how to go to heaven. We're actually building up the body to go take possession of territory. And I realized something. The Levites were 10% of the, of the army of Israel. My tribe was a tithe. We literally, in Deuteronomy, you read about it, we were 10% 10 of, the, of the Jews were Levitical. They were working in the temple, maintenance, temple, teaching, temple, this. 90% of the tribes of Israel were called to go expand the border of Israel. They were the tribes that crossed over with Joshua and actually took out the Philistines. They were the ones that took out the Canaanites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, the Bud Lights, whatever. <laughs> so they went out. They took them. And 10%, uh, here's, my, here's my conclusion. I want you to catch this. That, that there are those of you that are called to full-time ministry over here. 90% of you are going to find your convergence, your, your, your exploits, your excitement. The angels are out here expanding Israel's domain. And when God puts you out there, I want you to look from this day forward. Where is the garrison of the Philistines? Because the religious spirit has taught you, well, they're in charge now, and then when Jesus comes back in the age to come, you're going to see the kingdom of God. But that's not the word. Jesus said, all power in heaven and earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations. You see, the command he gave us was the opposite. All power in the heavenly realm and the earthly realm has been transferred to me. It doesn't happen when I return. It happened right now. So already you're living in the, in the realm where Satan is bullying you because he has, the, uh, the high places is visible. 
The high places has the microphone. The high places is the place of power. And uh, you're willing to kind of like be camped out here confused about what are we going to do? Lord, what's happening with America? I'm very upset what's happening with America. What's happening with Donald Trump? I think everything that's happening even with Donald Trump is just to exasperate people into mobilizing to go reoccupy their own culture. I don't think the devil can keep America from what God wants to do, but I think God's people have to show up. Does that make sense? Well, we have so much else to talk about, but I got carried away here and lost in the trivial details of my story of Saul. But I do want you to begin to pray from now on. Where is the garrison of the Philistine that you're called to go dispossess? You're being anointed and given authority. You'll have angels assigned to you. And, and, and you don't want to do it alone. You don't want to have to do it alone. You're not going to do it alone. I say, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. I think strong local churches like this need to have ecclesias, that small groups of special forces like Maximus with his gladiators. So God will add to you exactly who you need on your team. And if you're willing to do this, because my friend Bert Lindsay has helped me, he introduced me to the most interesting churches. And so we're seeing a church that's doing this in Florida right now. They're taking over school boards. They're taking over county commission seats. They're beginning to deploy their saints. And the saints are now going out and occupying the territory and bringing it under the righteous administration of, of heaven. And there's nothing the devil can do to stop it. So you have a choice. You can be either ruled by the Philistines. You can be ruled by righteousness. But it's not going to be because God set it up for you to lose. It's going to be because God set it up for you to win, but you didn't show up. I think I'm here because I'm here to help you. I will help you. I will help you form the micro groups that go in. I'll help you get clear as to how that works. And, we'll, and together we'll work on the convergence process because I believe every one of you is called to be champions. Every one of you is called to ascend the hill of the Lord. God doesn't have, uh, he doesn't have a plan B for your life. He has one great plan. And in the name of Jesus, I want to see you actually hit the convergence zone and do the thing that God created you to do, because that's where the fun is. Father, I thank you in Jesus' name for the, for the work that you're doing in this beautiful church and for the anointing that is on the people and for the revelation of Christ that is coming forth even at this hour. I thank you, Lord, that uh, this is the beginning of a, of a new friendship and that you'll be able to uh, work the schedule together so that we'll be able to find a way to help labor with this great church to see great things happen in the power of Jesus' name. It's a privilege to be here. Thank you for being friends and family. God bless you. was amazing. You know, as Lance was saying, God has a powerful plan and a future for your life. But if you don't know him tonight, you can't step into the joy of your destiny. You can't know your purpose. You can't find that place that God's called you to be. You can't be fulfilled on the inside. You're going to live a life empty and broken and searching, looking in all the wrong places. But tonight there's an answer. There's a hope. There's someone who wants to reach out and pull you out of that darkness that you've been struggling with tonight, and his name is Jesus. He's the son of God. He came to save us from our sins. He came to set us free from every demonic oppression that's tried to come against your life tonight. And so if that's you and you're like, Amy, I don't know all the stuff he was talking about, but I want it because it sounds amazing and exciting, it is. The very best life you can ever live on this earth is one that's lived for Jesus seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all this other stuff. He just takes care of it. He adds it. It's not what we're seeking because there, there's no hope in seeking after money or power or position or beauty, whatever it is that you think is going to fulfill that inner longing in your heart. The only thing that can fulfill that is Jesus. So tonight, would you just close your eyes? And I want, I want you to ask yourself this question. I want you to ask yourself, do I know him? Do I belong to Jesus tonight? Because if you don't, I want you to meet my best friend. 
I want to ask if you want to meet my best friend tonight. He'll save you. He'll set you free from that darkness. He'll give you hope and a future. And he'll walk with you every single day of your life so you don't have that feeling, that emptiness, that void, that hopelessness that you've been struggling with. And maybe you were raised in church and you kind of left and you haven't been living for him or you don't really have that close relationship with Jesus. But tonight he wants to come back in and he wants to walk with you every day. He doesn't want you to be alone. If that's you tonight, we're just going to simply say a prayer together from your seats. But I want you to raise your hand and mark the spot as my dad says that tonight was the night I said yes to Jesus and I called on his name and I became his kid and everything changed. If that's you tonight, just lift your hand up real quick and put it right back down. Thank you. Awesome. Who else? Who else is that you online? If that's you, I want you to just raise your hand and say, that's me. God sees the hand. God knows. And you're marking the spot and you're telling yourself, that's me tonight. I'm saying yes to Jesus. Anyone else? Anyone else? You feel the, your heart's beating faster. You're like, I know I need to say yes to Jesus. Listen, just do it because if I could beg you tonight, make that decision, make that decision. It will change your, the course of your life for the good. Amen. Online, say this prayer with us. Everybody repeat after us. Say, Jesus, I come to you tonight. I invite you into my heart. Be the Lord of my life. I want to make heaven my home. I want to be your child. Forgive me of my sin. Wash me clean. Set me free from the darkness. I step into your kingdom. I step out of that kingdom of darkness right now. In your name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Come on, let's give them a hand tonight. Hallelujah the best decision you'll ever make. We want to make sure you understand uh, what has happened tonight because, gosh, heaven is rejoicing. The angels are singing. There's a praise party going on in heaven right now over every single person that says yes to Jesus. So scan that QR code. We have a message from our senior pastors that they want you to hear, uh, and we're here for you. We want to answer your questions. If you'd made that decision tonight, our prayer team will be up at the end of service, and we would love to just meet you and to love on you and give you some more material tonight. Amen? Amen.